Hi, Praise family, and welcome to church. So this week, we're going to continue on the theme of rebuilding the church, only we're moving out of the book of Ezra, where they were talking about rebuilding the temple, and we're moving into the book of Nehemiah, where they're talking about rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. Uh, ben Lasota is going to carry the message today, and I'm excited because Ben <laughs> told me that this is one of his favorite portions of scripture, and uh, so I'm really excited because Ben does a great job of of bringing the message out of scripture in a modern context that applies to our daily lives. So, so that's pretty exciting. But before we get going on that, there's a couple of announcements. Uh, if you are interested in joining a women's Bible study, there are two options. You can join the Monmouth Bible study starting August 10th at 6.30 Monday nights and just, just meet outside. Or if you're in McMinnville, uh, Becky Timmons has a Bible study that just started up and it's a backyard Bible study, or you can join online, and that's Wednesday evenings, and that information will probably automatically appear on the screen here. And then lastly, if you're interested in uh, setting up tithing automatically, you can do that at our website. Uh, tithing is a great way to sort of hand over, I guess, financial trust to God and say, I'm going to let you take care of things. And so tithing is a is a wonderful opportunity. It's a wonderful form of worship. So you can do that online. That information also probably automatically appear. And uh, you can set up an automatic tithe, or if you have a one-time gift, you can uh, make your gifts that way as well. 
So with that, we're going to move into uh, the kids' presentation. Ezra's going to sort of bring his portion of Scripture and whatnot to a close with Jessica, and uh, then we'll move into the message. So with that, let's pray, and we'll let, the, uh, we'll let the kids take it from there. So Jesus, we thank you so much for this opportunity to get together and meet uh, online virtually and in person in certain instances. And we thank you, Lord, that your Spirit is with us whether we're together in person or not. And Lord, your spirit is a helper and a guide. And as we talk about rebuilding a wall in Jerusalem, Lord, help our hearts to be open to hear your message, that your spirit would speak to us directly about rebuilding our church and what that means in our personal lives as well. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you that we get to openly worship you. Thank you that we have the freedom to worship you. Lord, we ask that you would bless this time that we have together. All right, and everybody said amen. And so with that, we're going to let Jessica and Ezra kind of take it from here. Hello, boys and girls. I'm Jessica, and I'm here with my friend Ezra. Hello there, boys and girls. It's so nice to see you today. Today, we're continuing our series called Rebuilding the Church. And last week, we finished off the book of Ezra, but the story picks up in Nehemiah. Nehemiah worked hard for King Artaxerxes, who was king of Persia, one of the same kings who helped the people of Judah rebuild the temple of God. Nehemiah was visiting his brother who was from Judah, and Nehemiah began to ask how the people of Judah were doing. The brother must have hated being a, the bearer of bad news, but he said to Nehemiah, the people are not doing well. You see, the walls of Jerusalem have been destroyed by fire. When Nehemiah heard the news, he started weeping. Huh? Nehemiah started sleeping? No, 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 no. He did not take a nap. Nehemiah was so sad that he started to cry. When the king saw how sad Nehemiah was, the king asked, why does your face look so sad? This can only be sadness from the heart. You know, Ezra, sometimes the king would kill people for being sad around the king. Yes, Nehemiah did not know if the king was gonna kill him or how he was gonna react. But Nehemiah prayed and asked God for favor. Nehemiah told the king, how can my face not look so sad? The city where my ancestors are buried is in ruin. And the king looked at Nehemiah and said, how can I help you? God's favor was surely with Nehemiah. Nehemiah asked the king to let him go to Jerusalem with timber to rebuild the city walls. The king even sent some of his own men to protect Nehemiah on his long journey to Jerusalem. When Nehemiah got to Jerusalem, he spent the first few days walking around the borders of the city, looking at the cost of rebuilding. And then he gathered the people together and said, Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Boys and girls, can you draw us a picture of Nehemiah asking the king to let him go to Jerusalem? Oh, I would love to see that, boys and girls. And don't forget to put on your good listening ears and enjoy the message. Hey everybody, my name is Ben Lasota and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to speak to you guys today whenever you guys are listening. Um, I, I usually work within the, the um, 0 to 18 range in our Monmouth campus, which has been a little challenging with, with the virus. and um, But, you know, we're making it work. And, and I was thrilled to be asked to to um, speak during this time. So, and, and actually we're going to be looking at one of my favorite books in scripture, the book of Nehemiah. So we're continuing through our series called Rebuilding the Church. And the book of, of Nehemiah is actually more of like a volume two to the book of Ezra. See, the book of Ezra uh, focuses in on the rebuilding of of the temple in Jerusalem that was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then the book of Nehemiah focuses in on the rebuilding of the Jerusalem wall. See, a city back in this day, a city without walls, community without walls, was a vulnerable community. It was a community that anytime they had something of value, it could be easily stripped from them by, by enemy nations or, you know, thieves. So th this was... A city without walls was was not a, a it was a dangerous place. It was a place that you didn't want to bring your family up in. So, anyways, Jerusalem uh, they were attacked by the Babylonians. Uh, the walls were destroyed. 
years later, after the Bab- Babylonians take, took the Jews captive, the, um, the, the nation of Persia actually takes over the Babylonians and defeats them. So we have the Jewish people who their ancestors were, were slaves, and now they're actually being treated really well by the Persian people. And this Persian king is allowing uh, Jewish people to even advance in, in, in occupational, um, uh, there's occupation options for him even in the kingdom. And that's where Nehemiah is. He's a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. Say that name three times fast. Um, and, and the cupbearer would, he would, his responsibility was to drink the, the Kool-Aid or, or, or eat the food before the king to kind of not, not to taste test it and be like, yeah, that's, that's a good cooked steak. But really his job was to make sure it was poison. And if, if Nehemiah was to eat something and then slouch over and die, the king would know not to drink or not to eat from that plate. So Nehemiah, he's actually being visited by his brother who his brother returned to Jerusalem and uh, and again, Jerusalem was was just was destroyed by the Babylonians. So Nehemiah is asking his brother, "Hey, how is Jerusalem going since since the Jews have returned?" And so we pick up in uh, chapter one, verse three, three, three through four. And uh, his brother says, "This the people in Jerusalem are in great trouble and disgrace." The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. So I want to I answer a question here today. What do we do with other people's pain? Let me, let me answer this for you, and then just we're just going to go into it. Nehemiah, he bears the weight, and then he prays and waits. Let me say that again. He bared the weight, the, this community of Jerusalem, this community of Jewish people. He, like, he took it on as if it was his own pain, and then he waited and prayed. There, there's a, a famous celebrity uh, trainer, fitness coach, author, entrepreneur, entrepreneur um, John DeSena. And I, I watched an interview with him, and they were asking him, you know, you're really successful with helping people lose weight. What, what's, your, what's your secret? And he says, I'll, I'll sit down with a client. My first meeting, I'll sit with a client, and I'll say, how much weight do you want to lose? And then my client, he said his client would say, oh, I, I don't know, 45 pounds. And he would say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Every time I leave my house, I'm going to take my backpack and I'm going to put a 45-pound weight in my bag. And he said, every time I leave the house, I'm going to take this backpack with me doesn't matter if I'm going down the street to a grocery store or it doesn't matter if I'm going out of state on a business trip. And he would take a backpack and he would just carry it everywhere he went, 45 pounds or however much weight his client wanted to lose. He said, the next time you come in next week and you weigh in, if you weigh, if you've gained weight, I'm going to add weight to my bag. If you lose weight, I'm going to take away weight from my bag. Um, that'd be a lot of pressure on me. I don't know about you. Uh, it's, it, but it, this guy, he, this guy Joe, he, he literally just takes the weight that his clients are working with, and, and he just puts it on himself. That's what Nehemiah did. He took the weight, and he put it on himself. He carried it. Romans chapter 12, verse 15, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. See, the rejoicing part, that's the easy part. 
the mourning part, the grieving part, that is difficult. And here's what I'm proposing to you. Every time you hear about somebody suffering or someone going through pain, experiencing pain or grief, here's the question that I want you to ask. God, what do you want me to do with this weight? And would you take that weight, that grief, and just for a moment, it doesn't have to be a long time, but just for a moment, would you just carry that weight just for a moment? And it could be, it could be your, your neighbor across the street. Maybe they're going through a hard time. Or it could be an explosion in the capital of Lebanon. And it's like, geez, you know, if I, if I carry just an ounce of that, that grief, that's, you know, most of the time when we're carrying grief and we're carrying someone else's pain just for a moment and we ask God, what am I to do with this? The answer is just going to be to pray. Because we only have so much time, we only have so much resources, we can't do everything. So most of the time it will just be to pray, which when we're asking the God who has unlimited resources to intervene in a situation, that's a big thing that we can do. Don't, don't downplay prayer for a moment. Nehemiah, he, he could have just heard the news about the walls of Jerusalem and just went on with his day. He lived 800 miles away from Jerusalem. He lived a comfortable life. He worked his way up the corporate ladder. ladder. He, had, he didn't have a, a, a reason that really benefited himself to grieve over Jerusalem. But he took that pain and he made it his own. And he, and he, he grieved for four months. He just prayed. I remember uh, my wife and I, we took classes through um, to become certified foster parents just because we had a relative who went into the foster care system. And um, when she was returned, we, we just felt like there was a pretty good likelihood that she would go back into foster care. And we wanted to be, be prepared to take her so, and not go through the certification process um, with her in our care. So we were going through these courses and just, I mean, 15, 20 minutes in, I felt the weight, the burden in foster care. And, um, and I, I prayed, I said, Lord, I said, this is, this is weighing heavy on me. And if you don't kind of lighten this burden from me or make it clear to me that I'm not supposed to be a part of the solution or, or at least step in and do something, then I'm going to do something. And it took three, four days. I can't remember exactly. It was a matter of days. And the burden just stayed with me. And so... After a few days, I ended up uh, telling my wife, who was already all into foster care, by the way, I said, hey, let's, let's do foster care. And that was, um, that was years ago, and, and we've had a number of kids who have lived with us. Sometimes the burden will, will turn into action. So after bearing the weight for four months, Nehemiah, during that time, he decided that he was going to do something about it. And so Nehemiah is recognizing God's timing. And we see that Nehemiah, he goes to the king and he's looking sad. And, and back in this day, looking sad in front of the king was reason for the king to, to execute you. Because back in this day, uh, it was kind of like a, a saying that, that the king makes you forget all of your worries. Being in the presence of the king makes you forget your trouble. 
So Nehemiah, he's showing his, his sadness written all over his face in front of the king. And the king says, what is it that you want? What's going on? And, he, and, and Nehemiah says, how can I not be sad? He said, the city where my ancestors are buried, buried the walls have been destroyed. The city's in chaos. And so chapter 2 of verse 4 says this. It says, the king said to me, what is it that you want? Then, then I prayed to the God of heaven. I don't think Nehemiah, I don't think Nehemiah took a time out and went to the altar and prayed. I think Nehemiah had been continuously praying in his head. But he said, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you be back? It pleased the king to send me. So I set a time. My second point, don't race past God's pace. I can just picture God saying, Nehemiah, walk with me, work with me, see how I do it. Walk with me, work with me, see how I do it. See the rhythm, walk with me, work with me, see how I do it. Isaiah 55 verse 9 says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Nehemiah waited four long months for the pace of God. Four long months he just took on, bared the weight, and prayed, and waited for God's timing. Not getting ahead of God in what God wanted to do. When my wife and I moved to the Mammoth Independence area. Um, I was so excited to live in the community that I pastored. And I wanted to, uh, I, I just wanted to come in and just invite everybody to church. And there were so many kids that lived around us. And I, and I just want to be like, hey, everybody, just jump in the van. I'll take you to youth group, right? But, uh, but my wife was like, what do you, you can't, you can't just do that. You got to build relationship with them. You got to. Take it slow. And, you know, I was, I, was, I was acting like the rapture was going to happen that night, like I was in a, some sort of hurry. I was out of rhythm. Walk with me. Work with me. See how I do it. And so I took it slow. I, I took advantage of the opportunities that I had to love on my neighborhood to love on my neighbors. And it was a long, drawn-out process. But here I am a year and a half later, and it's actually kind of funny because uh, two of my neighbors are actually in the sanctuary with me. Um, yeah, one of them just waved at me. Uh, on, a, on a given um, youth group night, I will, I will have three or four neighborhood kids at youth group I I just wonder if I would have messed that up somehow if I would have hit the ground running instead of taking it at God's pace walk with me work with me see how I do it Nehemiah he he gets to um, the, the king allows Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah is in Jerusalem. And, and, and again, I'm reading this, the, the book of Nehemiah, and I'm just like, Nehemiah is going to hit the ground running. He's been waiting four months for this moment. He's going to get there and be like, I've got a plan. But Nehemiah, he gets to Jerusalem, and he's just like, he, he just, it just says like he's waiting a few days. And he's just walking around the city for, for a few days, every night, just walking through the city. He said, he said, I didn't tell anybody what I was here to do. Nehemiah was, Nehemiah was counting the cost. 
he was looking at the destruction and he was and he was just calculated and he was going okay we're going to need you know this much labor this this much resources it's going to be this much leadership he's counting the cost and then Nehemiah, after a few days, he rounds up the leaders of Jerusalem. And in chapter 2, verse 17, it says this. Nehemiah speaking, it says, Then I said to him, you see the trouble that we are in? You notice, this, you notice how he says we? He never took the backpack off. He's still bearing the weight. He says, Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be a disgrace. I also told them about the glorious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. The leaders, they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this work. The third point, final point that I want to say to you guys today is let's be driven in the vision. I remember when my wife and I first, uh, well, my wife was hired by Praise Assembly. And um, she honestly, she took a, I mean, I'm just going to say it how it is. She took a pretty good pay cut. She was working for the state. We, we kind of, um, you know, we no longer had the state benefits. And, uh, and so we, we sacrificed financially, um, but she, I mean, we both felt like God was calling us into this kind of ministry. But I remember the first month that my wife was hired, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sitting in the congregation, and I'm watching Pastor Joe preach, and he, he's up, <laughs> he, he starts to say, he says, okay, listen, I need you guys to stop coming to church here. And I'm sitting there in the congregation like, what? What is this guy doing? What is this guy saying? And he says, we're, we're, we're partnering. We're, we're coming together with a church in McMinnville. And I need some of the families here to stop coming here and start attending this McMinnville church. And I sat there and I was just like, this guy is going to, call my wife into his office in like four or five months and he's going to tell her that she's going to have to get her pay cut back because he's shipping part of the finances to McMinnville. Like, I was honest, that was what I was thinking, very selfishly. You know what my problem was? Is I never caught the vision, at least not at that point. You see, praise has the five guiding values Submitted, safe, uh, spiritually awake, serving as teams, and then sent. And it took me a while to catch on to sent. And um, I took comfort in knowing that I wasn't the only one who took a while to catch on to sent. Sent is hard. The disciples... Um, they're hanging out with Jesus, and it's one of the last things that Jesus said to the disciples. Matthew 28, verse 19, he says, go. He's talking to his, his followers, his disciples. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Did you know that his disciples actually stayed in Israel? They stayed in that nation. And yeah, they were doing good work there. But then this guy named Stephen, he was the first believer to be murdered for his faith in Christ. When he was murdered, the, the, um, the disciples and the believers, they scattered. And it took that event for, the, for these disciples to... to spread to other nations and all of a sudden the gospel started taking roots in other nations and other communities and other people groups i i bet 
God was, God doesn't like people being, st- Stephen was stoned. That's painful. God doesn't like that. God doesn't enjoy the coronavirus. But listen, some of you guys need to be sent, not geographically, but as, as, a, as a praise church, we are moving forward towards home groups. And some of you guys are pastors, but you have an empty church. And I know that there's other people who are in vulnerable, popu- vulnerable populations. Like, listen, I'm not, I'm not really speaking to you. I, I'm talking to those who are kind of already know what I'm talking about anyways. Like God's kind of put this on your heart. Maybe you've, you've put this off for, for, for a minute. But listen, it's time. It's time that you be sent that you open the next praise campus, your home. And you could say, well, I don't feel like I could be a pastor. I'm sorry, but once you're a Christian, you're a pastor. Like That's just the way. I don't know why we get it twisted that pastors need to be on some sort of stipend. You know, that's not the way that it works. Will you open up your home? Will you be the next praise campus? We're sending you. Um, Nehemiah, he did change locations. And sometimes I just think about if he just would have stayed, his life would have been easy. It would have been comfortable, laid back. But he went. He took on the burden. This thing gets heavy after a while, by the way. But he took on the burden. He stayed with God's pace. Watch with me. Work with me. See how I do it. The rhythm of God. And then last, he casted vision. The people of Jerusalem came behind him, worked with him. As we go on through this series, you're going to see this incredible work that that Nehemiah leads. It's amazing. I'm not going to spoil it for you, though. Maybe some of you guys already know the story. It's great. It's great. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and close and, and just uh, we'll, we'll throw some reflection questions up after, after our closer today. But Lord, thank you for um, this, just the, everybody who's listening, Lord. I, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you just drill in whatever was said today that, that needs to be heard precious name.
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine, you are forever
never stop, never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Ben, that was awesome. I, I so enjoyed hearing those words come out of your mouth. That's, that is a subject that just, it just fires me up. And the best way that I could explain it is, uh, <laughs> imagine carrying a glass of water full to the brim and you're trying to walk across town and you're gonna spill it. You're gonna spill it, you're gonna bump into somebody, you're gonna take a step, you're gonna do a pothole or something. If your glass is full to the brim, you're going to be spilling water. <laughs> and that's what God calls us to do with Him and with His Spirit and His relationship, to be so full to the brim that we can't help but pour it out. Being sent. <laughs> we are sent every day. And I'm talking to you. If you have a pulse, you're being sent into this world. And I got to tell you, it, it also took me a while to realize this because my family and I, as you know, most of you know, we, we took a, a trip to Mexico and we lived there for, the, for a year and we called it being on the mission field. I'm Mexican, so I call it being home. But I'm back in the U.S. and we're getting ready and I'm like, Lord, let's do it again. Send me again. I'm ready. Let's go wherever. I, I would kneel down in front of this huge map uh, in one of the buildings that I used to clean. They had this map that was just the size of a wall, and I would kneel in front of it, and I would just be like, God, wherever, whenever. I shouted like Shakira, but anyway, that's a different subject. But really, I was just passionate, and I was just, God, send me. And God was just being quiet, and I just kept saying, send me, send me. I'm ready. Grow me. Make me boldness. Give me boldness. Let's go. Let's go. And then one day, God answered, and he said, Beto, what if I already have? What if I want you in McMinnville? What if I want you in the house that you're living at now? Don't wait. Don't wait. This is your mission field. And I love that God is speaking to us as a church and asking us collectively to go and to go now. We just, we said, you know, um, we sent Judy, we prayed for Judy because she's going to be going to Mississippi. And we talked a little bit about the, the guiding value of being sent, just like Ben was talking about. And in this series of rebuilding the church, oh, I got to tell you that our house burned down. <laughs> and when your house burns down, you remember everything that you have in your house. And you remember the memories. And it's hard to have that loss. 
but you get to rebuild it. Do you want to build the exact same house that burnt down? I don't. If I have a clean slate, hey, let's make the living room a little bit bigger. Or how about a kitchen? Let's remodel the kitchen, add another bedroom, put a slide. <laughs> we have an amazing opportunity. Let's not miss it. Church has been redefined. Let's stand close, be close, push in close to the Father and say, God, let's rebuild. What is it going to look like? Let's not go back to what it was before. Let's move forward. And I really think that that's not so much rebuilding the physical building of a church, but to claiming your house, your neighborhood, your city. That's your church. Ha! So let's go out and let's do this together. Before they kick me off stage, uh, I'm supposed to tell you that there's going to be a couple of questions for discussion. Read those. They're going to be amazing. We're going to discuss as groups. If you're by yourself, we've been saying, hey, grab a journal. Journal those questions out. You are not going to be alone very much longer because the harvest is ready. The fields are ready for harvest. That's what I meant to say. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that, that uh, even though you could do everything yourself with just a single breath, Father, that even then you invite us to partner with you to accomplish what you want to accomplish on this earth. And I love the fact that even though we may make mistakes, even though we might not hear you correctly, even though we may not be as prepared as we think we are, or whatever excuse we throw out at you, Father, you say, hey, I called you and you are perfect. And if you need tools, I will provide them. And if you need anything else, it's already been provided for you. Can I just tell you that the road that you're walking, I already walked on, and I will make sure that you have everything you need. All you have to do is give me three letters, a Y, an E, and an S, and just say yes. I've called you. I've called you. There is nobody on this earth more perfectly than you because I've created you for such a time as this. And so, Father, as we, as we wrap up, as we finish, as we go into discussion, Father, I just pray that you would continue to shake us up, continue to make us uncomfortable, continue to prune us and grow us and mold us into the people that you need for this time today. And collectively we say this in Jesus' name, amen.